Okay, fam, welcome back. <clears throat> so today we're going to be going over the monthly macro overview for September of 2024. So with that being said, let's get it. Okay, so we're going to actually start a little bit differently on this video than I normally would. And that's going to be with the monthly timeframes on a lot of these different metrics that we look at. Okay, so we're going to start with the indices. So pretty much on the S&P, a uh, couple of things I want to note here is that, number one, the candle hasn't closed yet, but the markets are pretty much closed at this point. So you guys can see we have yet another hammer candle on the SPX. Okay, last month after we saw that, we had what a small dip and then a massive pop and we ended up higher. So I want to point that out. <clears throat> Uh, the other thing to note here is that usually when the RSI gets into the overbought territory on the monthly, which it kind of is right now, but not really, uh, it can actually stay in overbought territory for a long time before having a pullback. Okay, so we saw March 2021 to August 2021, this thing was in overbought territory and markets just kept on marching higher. It wasn't actually until we got this bearish divergence shortly after that that we saw a pullback in markets, so it took nearly an entire year before entering overbought territory to actually see any kind of real pullback. So do I think a pullback is going to happen in the next few months? No, I don't think so. Okay, so kind of the same thing on the um, NASDAQ. NASDAQ has actually been underperforming the SPX. You guys can see the SPX is pushing all-time highs, whereas the NASDAQ is slightly lower than that previous high up there at almost 21,000. Uh, we're not we're kind of slowly edging into overbought but we're not really there yet um but the nasdaq is much more volatile than the s p you guys can see this thing was an overbought for a long long time okay so we had a small pullback here in 2018 uh, but then again that was really nothing and then you know we kind of poked in and out of overbought here on the monthly time frame for literally years before eventually pulling back uh, and we're just now starting to get close to it. But do I think that means that the market's topped out? No. No, I don't. <clears throat> so again, we have a very, very similar looking pattern here. So we had a hammer candle last month and another one this month. We're still within, we're still on the inside of this kind of a rising broadening wedge. So I still think this is bullish. I don't think there's a reason to worry here. Um, Russell 2000, this is a pretty bullish looking candle. I would have liked to have seen the... Uh, candle body close at the top of this thing that would have been more bullish uh, but regardless it is still up um, it's pretty much looks like the Russell is going to close pretty much about the same close that we had for uh, the last month so um, the, the bottom line here on the monthly is that this thing is above the previous swing high that's what matters so next level is going to be up here at roughly about 2370 to uh, the all-time highs at 2450 Okay, so uh, not going to take a look at the VIX on this one. Okay, so Dow Jones, uh, kind of a similar thing here. So we have this channel pattern. We're actually closer to the bottom than the top. In my opinion, that means we could have a lot more upside to come. Um, again, in the next few months in bullish seasonality. The RSI is not really overbought, but the thing I want to point out here is that we do have two very bullish looking hammer candles. Again, usually that's a bullish sign. That means that the markets are going to go higher. So that's kind of what I'm seeing here. And for the NASDAQ, I mean, same thing. We're kind of at the bottom of this channel, but the candle is green. Same thing here. So what that tells me is likely the markets are just simply going to move higher. Okay, so on the weekly time frame, um, we have... Uh, kind of pulled back a little bit on the RSI here uh, as the markets have been climbing. Now, uh, in my opinion, I mean, this could be looked at one of two ways, okay? This could either be a bearish divergence or this could be the uh, market simply walking the indicators back as the price continues to rip and or kind of consolidate. As you guys could see, Back here, I mean, basically the markets did absolutely nothing during this time frame, uh, and just kind of went sideways. I mean, we had a we had a big drop here on the uh, kind of flash crash, but it pretty much didn't do much of anything. Okay, it just went sideways, and then we eventually popped out of it uh, just a few weeks ago, and now we're barely starting to move up again. That's the markets are kind of waiting for the job data. So, 
Uh, I don't really think the markets have really started taking off to the upside yet. Okay, we haven't seen one of these moves right here. It's kind of just been up and down and all around. Um, so in my opinion, it's kind of looking a little bit more like Bitcoin than it does like an actual bearish divergence. And speaking of Bitcoin, uh, usually we talk about this in a separate video, but I want to show you guys this in this video. So uh, going over the monthly time frame here, which again is going to close pretty soon. Um, we, I mean, unless Bitcoin rips a lot in the next four hours, it's, we're going to have a green close below this red one. Do I think that's bearish? No, honestly, I don't. Um, I mean, look, we're going into a quarter that's pretty much as close to a guarantee as you can get that Bitcoin's going to skyrocket to the moon. Uh, we have not sold out of the bottom of this channel yet. So in my, in my mind, and we have this long buyer's wick here, just like the last two, uh, in my mind, this is still very bullish. Okay, so I'm going to go back over here to the weekly, but on the NASDAQ. So, yeah, I, I think the markets are just simply being walked back at this point. I don't think there's any real reason to kind of worry about what may happen in the next few weeks or months. Um, again, I mean, this could be interpreted as bearish divergence, but I just kind of really don't see that. What I, what I would want to see in a bearish divergence situation is that the market is just screaming higher while we're getting this kind of pullback in these indicators. But again, that's not really exactly what's been happening here, okay? So pretty much the gist of this is, uh, even if I go out here to like, let's say this swing low and this swing high, I mean, the markets have mostly just been sideways, slightly up, but mostly just sideways for basically the last seven months. I mean, from this swing high back here to where we currently sit, the NASDAQ's only moved up six, roughly about 7%. I mean, that's not really that much for something as volatile as the NASDAQ. So again, I, I would say it's just a kind of a pullback in time, not actually a bearish divergence. So Russell's looking good. Um, I'd like definitely like to see kind of a, a, a break out of this downtrend line here. You can see we pushed against it multiple times. Uh, it does look very bullish. It's just a matter of getting out of it. So uh, there's going to be, in my opinion, there will likely be need to be some kind of news catalyst to see it actually break out, which I think is going to be the jobs data that we're going to get this week, which in my opinion is probably going to be quite bullish. And I think the markets are going to like it. Okay. So uh, in terms of the support, 2120, <clears throat> I mean, the fact that we had this flash crash and we did not go lower, we just immediately did a V-shaped recovery twice actually on the Russell tells me likely it's probably not coming back down to this uh, white line here. Could I be wrong about that? Sure. Do I think I'm going to be wrong about that? No. So I already went over the resistance here um, in terms of the levels. So Dow Jones, I mean, this thing is kind of sitting at the bottom of the channel, but again, you know, I mean, we are in bearish seasonality. So uh, it's possible this thing could just simply lift straight off of the bottom of this channel, kind of do something maybe like this and kind of in into the end of the year or something like that. Um, I still consider this to be bullish. I mean, the Dow Jones is basically sitting at all time highs. Usually when the markets are at all time highs, the vast majority of the time they just keep making new all time highs. That's kind of how the stock indices work. Um, in terms of a pullback area, I'd be looking for about 40,800 40, as a potential area. We're well above this previous zone from the uh, previous all-time highs from 2021, so I wouldn't be looking at that as an area right now, uh, just my opinion. Okay, so next thing on the list here, we're going to go over the uh, stocks above the 50 and 200-day moving average. Um, stocks above the 50-day moving average on the S&P are looking a little bit rich right now. Again, I do think the NASDAQ is actually undervalued compared to this, uh, but I mean we're not actually within that box yet. And usually when we are, it takes a little while to actually kind of pull back out of it. Um, again, if I go back in time here, you guys can see that usually, um, so, so basically this thing can get to overbought and the markets could still go up. Okay. Uh, so that could be a situation that we're getting to, um, where eventually, you know, any of these pullbacks here are basically just met by bull demand and people want to buy it up and they don't really care. Markets go higher, that kind of stuff. So uh, it does look a little bit rich, but again, 
The fact that we're sitting above a 50 tells me we're in the bull zone and swing traders love it when it's above the 50. They love it because again, this is a short term time frame um, stocks above the moving averages. Uh, these are the best times to buy down here in the green box. I'm not sure that we're going to see one of these again anytime soon. I'm just going to be honest about that. Okay, so NASDAQ 50. Again, you can see we are well below the kind of sell box there, sell zone. Um, once again, this kind of reiterates my point that I think the NASDAQ is uh, a little bit undervalued compared to the S&P right now, which means it could have a lot of room to go up in the following months. Uh, S&P will probably still go up, but I think the, um, in my opinion, the NASDAQ and crypto is probably going to outperform the S&P in the following months. Uh, it's not to say the S&P can't go higher. I just think that these other things have more room to run up. So, I mean, again, the green zone is the buy zone. Red zone is the sell zone. We're closer to the red zone than the, than the green zone. And the, um, the actual <clears throat> the candle that we see currently is actually above the 50, which again is good for the bulls. It's also good for swing traders. Okay, so stocks above the 200-day moving averages. So 62% of the stocks in the NASDAQ currently are above their 200-day. That's very bullish. Again, that 50 level is kind of what we're looking for to determine bull or bear territory. We're in the bull territory. Um, we've seen some kind of dips below it in previous times and every single time we got back above it, I see that as bullish. Uh, and again, this is, this is not so much for swing traders. This is more for investors because this is a long term 200 day moving averages. I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a seven month moving average. This is more for investors. Okay. Looking to buy at premium opportunities. Um, so anything below the 50, in my opinion, is a good time to buy for long-term investors. Anything above the 50 is a good time to either hold and or potentially uh, sell and take profit and reposition the cash. Um, but, you know, a lot of people do still buy at all-time highs because, like I said, most of the time when the uh, markets are at all-time highs, usually they just keep going to new all-time highs. Okay, so S&P above the 200-day. Uh, once again, this thing is really kind of edging against that overbought territory there. Uh, do I necessarily think that means that it has to pull back? Not really. I mean, the R, like I said, the RSI and the MACD has kind of get, been getting walked back here a little bit. You can see the last time we got to the overbought area, the RSI was at almost a 70, whereas right now it's only at a 58. Uh, the MACD back then had a death cross, whereas right now it has a golden cross. And the histogram back then was red, whereas of right now it's green. So that pretty much paints the picture for y'all about that. Again, I do think that the markets have been kind of getting slowly walked back, getting ready for that bullish seasonality to take off to the upside. Okay, so uh, 210 year inverted uh, yield curve. Let's see if I can figure this out. So we got the 02Y slash US 10Y. Okay, so this thing is officially uninverted. Usually when this thing uninverts, it, you know, a lot of people get terrified. They're like, oh, it's, it's gonna it's, it's gonna drop. You know, we're all we're all, all our stocks are gonna go to zero, all that kind of stuff. Uh, do I think that's gonna happen at this point? No, I don't think so. I mean, not really. I mean, look, it is uninverted, but there's there's a lot of mixed signals going on. Okay, we have positive GDP, uh, the markets are bullish, they're going to all time highs, the unemployment rate is low. Okay, even the founder of the SOM rule came out and said, well, she doesn't think that this SOM trigger is necessarily actually a positive confirmation of a recession. So she's basically just, what she was basically saying is she's canceling the, the indicator on her own recession this particular time. Okay. Uh, the other thing I want to point out here is that like you guys can see back in 2021, when we hit that, well, we hit the peak actually kind of right here in November. Um, so the Fed started raising rates and tightening up here, and we actually got the technical bear market, the death cross, and you know the uh, basically this thing was doing the opposite of what it should be doing. Usually, when this thing drops, is when when we end up getting some kind of technical correction. But in this case, it was actually going up when we got the bear market back in 2022. Um, because again, you guys remember the pandemic of 2020, right? So basically the market started really crashing kind of around that January, February, March timeframe. Um, and it was just an absolute bloodbath. Well, what happened with the 
uh, inverted or the yield curve inversion to 10. Uh, basically, it uninverted and the markets crashed. This time, the markets actually crashed when it went up, and now it's going down, but the markets are going up. And the other thing I want to point out here is in March of 2022, when the Fed raised rates, this thing was actually overbought, okay? And we got a death cross. Uh, as of right now, it's oversold. So do I think this is an indication that likely that as this thing comes down, the um, that the markets are going to crash? No, I don't. I think what's going to happen is, once again, the markets are gonna, probably going to slowly walk this down. As this thing kind of starts pointing up, as the MACD points up, again, I'm kind of expecting that to play out here. Okay, so Fed funds rate, um, I mean, that one's pretty straightforward. They did cut rates. Um, again, I don't know why it's not reflecting here. For some reason, it, it should be updated, but it's not. So basically, the Fed funds rate is at point, kind of that 4.75 to 5 uh, area, whereas it was 5.25 to 5 before. So um, not sure why that hasn't changed. Again, borrowing rates have changed, so I'm sure they cut because I've seen it personally in my own accounts. But uh you know, for whatever reason, it hasn't updated here. So I don't, I don't know why that is, but, um, in terms of, uh, basically inflation, look, I'm expecting inflation to continue coming down. I mean, there's no reason for inflation not to come down. Okay. Um, I mean, they've held rates higher for longer. They're going to get the soft landing. Inflation will come down in my opinion, while the unemployment rate, re, re, <laughs> the unemployment rate remains relatively flat, Okay, it it's, might go up and down a little bit, but it's probably going to remain mostly flat, kind of around where it is now. And companies will hire more and more and more and more and more and more as the Fed continues to cut rates. And in my opinion, it's already started happening and it's likely going to continue to happen going in the months and years going forward in time. So that covers um, inflation. Again, unemployment rate is coming up this next week. So it is starting to slowly tick up. Am I worried about this at this point? No. Uh, initially, I was a little bit concerned about it, but after taking a deeper look at all the indicators, I would say it's really not something to worry too much about. Uh, even the mar look, even the markets on Friday are expecting the unemployment rate to stay exactly where it is. So, um, yeah, I don't think there's really too much to worry about here on this one. Okay, so. Now it's time to go take a look at oil. Okay, so oil is, uh, this one's interesting. So we did not get the W pattern that I thought we were going to get. We were actually kind of sitting in the zone. So, I mean, the buy area here is kind of between 61 to 76 and the sell area up here at 90 to 95. Do I think it's going to get above 95 again? Mm. Probably not, if I'm being completely honest. What I do think could happen, and you know, I, I know there's a lot of oil bulls out here um, that probably are bullish on oil. I've even seen some comments where we're like, oh, why are you bearish on oil? Well, because I understand how these these events work, okay? When, there, when there's no wars, when there's no inflation, and when they're producing you know record levels of barrels of oil per day, the, the increase in demand and supply... Um, how do I explain this? Well, usually there, there's an excess of demand and there is a supply. So even though they're both at all time highs. So that usually keeps the price of oil suppressed. Okay. But here's what I do think can happen. Okay. So when the wars come to an end, Trump gets reelected, they build back up the strategic petroleum reserve, which I don't know if it's still at all time lows or not. Um, it was at one point, but when they eventually do that, um, again, the Democrats wouldn't do that because it goes against their whole grain policy, right? Oh, well, we can't we can't be producing oil because then it makes us look like hypocrites. They can't do that, right? Because it makes them look bad. It makes them look like a liar, uh, which would be understandable. But here's what I do think is going to happen, okay? When all those bad things end and demand skyrockets for, you know, gas, gas becomes cheaper to drive your car, fly a plane, all that kind of jazz, demand is going to go up. I do think we could see some vacillation in between these areas, okay? This resistance and this support. So there is actually some upside here. Um, I do think oil stocks will become a little bit cheaper to buy, but I do think it's possible that we actually could go back up into that kind of 90 to 95 area, kind of vacillate there for a while and just kind of bounce it between these ranges in the more midterm. All right, so I'm going to go over metals now. 
Uh, we'll start with gold. So I'm actually going to do this on the monthly time frame. So gold has had an absolutely unbelievable run. It's even <laughs> moved even more than I thought it would. Um, I've told you guys my stance on precious metals before, with the exception of copper. Uh, gold and silver specifically are basically um, people buy them uh, in anticipation of a recession or possibly even like economic collapse. It's known as a fear trade. What do I mean by this? Well, when times are good, there is no recession, there is no inflation, there is no wars, none of that. Usually the price of metals will come down. Okay. And when, so basically when there's, when there's economic certainty, the price of these theoretically come down. When there's economic uncertainty, the price of it goes up. Okay. As you can see here during the pandemic, uh, even before the pandemic, this thing started taking off to the moon and then even more so recently. So yeah, I think gold's pretty expensive. Okay. I'm not going to lie. I think it's very expensive. Um, personally, I would not buy right now. I would rather buy Bitcoin than gold because gold's literally sitting right at all time highs. Bitcoin's still like 20 something percent off off all time highs. I think it's cheaper uh, from an investor investor perspective. But you can see during the uh, great financial crisis that gold took off to the moon um, as the markets were kind of crashing. And yeah, so eventually we got this overbought signal on the RSI and then we got the MACD death cross and the price of gold went down substantially from the previous all time highs. So it went down roughly about 46% from the all time highs. And once again, I mean, this is on the monthly time frame. This is the biggest time frame we would look at here. When the RSI got oversold, what did we get? We got a substantial pullback. Okay. 24% pullback. We did get overbought on the RSI. We did get the death cross on the MACD. And now we have another RSI overbought signal, which means, again, in my opinion, it's expensive. So if we get a 24% pullback, we'd basically pull back to the previous all-time highs at 2,000. Or look, Hold on, let me actually remeasure that. I'm not sure if that's right. Uh, yeah, so roughly about 2,000. However, if we get one of these kind of pullbacks, which I think is more likely, again, I think we're going back, we're going into soft landing and uh, likely we're just going to go into another big secular bull market, in my opinion, in stocks. Um when something like this happens, metals do pull back a lot. So 46% pullback here, um, that could lead to potentially gold pulling back as far as roughly about $1,400 an ounce. You can see there is kind of a previous uh, resistance turn support, also a breakout area right around that level. Okay, so next one on the list here is silver. Uh, silver is not as expensive as gold. You guys can see last time this thing got overbought on monthly. It was just, it had a heinous drop. I mean, this thing was stupid. Um, so yeah, I mean the drop on this thing from the high to the low with the exception of that wick down there was 72%. Um, it's not overbought yet, but let's just say maybe silver peaks out maybe somewhere around kind of where that white line is roughly about the $38 area. Pulls back 72%. Do I think it's going down to $10 now? It's probably not. Um, but I, I will say that silver is modest compared to gold at this point. I still think it's actually quite cheap compared to what it could be. Um, I would say probably it comes back to somewhere in between this channel. So somewhere between $20 to about $28, maybe kind of closer to that $20 level over the long term. But at these prices, I would not buy it because, again, we're kind of in that resistance zone, which we did have a massive bear market swing down from last time. Okay. Palladium is extremely cheap. You can kind of see this real long-term trend line here. Again, we are getting two golden crosses below the bull levels here. That's a very bullish indication. Uh, the RSI did home almost hit over sold. So the price of palladium could go up in the future. Again, Kind of that buy level here is roughly about 900 to 1,000, and then 3,000 is going to be roughly about that resistance up there at the highs. Uh, I mean, the if you can get your hands on some, the potential gain here in the coming years could be substantial, 224%. Uh, platinum kind of just going sideways. I mean, based on these indicators down here, it's at fair value. Um, in my opinion, based on technicals, I think it's quite cheap. So 800 to about 840 is support there. And then you have the 
roughly about 1775 to 1915 at resistance. Again, this thing is, um, has a lot of upside. So I, I would consider, in, in my opinion, I would consider, uh, for me personally, buying palladium and platinum over gold and silver at this point. So copper, uh, this thing continues to go up. Generally speaking, when times are good, you can see that, uh, well, I, I guess, yeah, I guess this is really no different than, uh, gold or silver when times are good it usually does come down but this kind of goes all over the place this is kind of a two-sided metal so on one side it's a fear trade but on the other side it's also a kind of a measure of economic demand the more this thing goes up in my opinion the stronger the demand is in the economy and currently we see it going up uh, but if you're looking to buy this thing then again the macro zone down here is 132 two dollars and the uh, macro resistance roughly about 410 to 510 so uh, it's a little more on the expensive side at this point okay so um last thing i want to go over here is the dollar index so you can see the dollar index is slowly st starting to falter out um, again we did get below this trend line here we are getting very very close to getting below this green box um, again, this green box is a multi-year box. Uh, this should give you an example of what happens when it gets below it. Okay. So right here, when this thing fell, that's when Bitcoin started to rip. Okay. So we're looking for something like this, like a breakdown below this green box on the dollar, and then Bitcoin will fly off to the moon. In my opinion, that's going to start happening probably next month, uh, even into November, December, and then you know, eventually we'll end up getting the crypto bear market kind of close to 2026. So um, overall, I would say markets look bullish. Um, I'm expecting crypto and stocks to continue to go up for the next three months. I think metals for the most part are a little expensive. Uh, palladium and platinum are relatively cheap. Oil can still go up based on increased demand in the economy. Um, I'm expecting unemployment to stay flat. I am expecting companies to hire more employees as the Fed continues to cut rates and or print money because, again, it's cheaper not just for people but for companies to borrow money when the Fed cuts rates. Uh, and I'm expecting a soft landing. So that's that's kind of the game plan here. So anyways, hope you all enjoyed this content. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all later. Peace.